Today I'm going to be walking between two of the best known and most intriguing prehistoric landmarks anywhere in West Sussex. I haven't visited either of them for donkey's years and to be honest I'm really looking forward to seeing them now and as we come to the crest of this hill I think yeah there it is Chanctonbury standing out like a beacon on the northern edge of the downs. These two Iron Age hill forts were once surrounded by visible traces of their fieldscapes. But ploughing since the Second World War has all but erased those surface remains. On our journey between the two hill forts, we'll be looking at the long-running struggle between archaeologist and farmer. Now, both Chanctonbury Ring and Sisbury are Iron Age hill forts, as you perhaps could have guessed from that, that berry element of the place name. Burr, meaning uh, a fortification in Anglo-Saxon. So they're built at some point between about 1000 and 500 BC. But what makes both Chanctonbury and Sisbury exciting is that they have much longer and very complex histories that go well beyond the Iron Age. So here we are at the, at the Ordnance Survey triangulation pillar, marked on the map by that neat little blue triangle there. It's not quite on the highest point of the ridge, that's occupied by the hill fort over there, but even so you can see why the Ordnance Survey picked this particular spot for their surveying station. It's a, it's a magnificent view, huge view, looking all the way northwards across the Weald. It's a fantastic place to put a monument at any point in history. Come on, Basil. Between the Trig Pillar and the Hill Fort, we cross a territorial boundary marked by a bank and ditch, built in the late Bronze Age and later modified in the Roman period. We also pass a tumulus, or early Bronze Age burial mound. The low bank surrounding the hill fort was once a much more impressive barrier, a solid wall of chalk fronted by a timber palisade. I remember the last time I was up here at Chanctonbury Ring really, really clearly. It was the summer of 1987. I was just coming towards the end of my gap year before going to university and I brought some Australian friends up here, expecting to impress them with this fantastic prehistoric monument and this amazing panorama. But what really caught my friend's imagination that day was in fact this magical ring of trees planted only 250 years ago by a local lad by the name of Charles Goring when he was 16. Then, on the 16th of October 1987, only a few weeks after my visit with the Australians, the hurricane struck. The big uh, landscape that we know had very much changed, so we all came up here to have a look, and my family were involved with helping clear some of the trees in the area as well, so just shock really, and so lovely to see it coming back together again as it is now, yeah. But the extraordinary thing is, that the 18th century tree ring wasn't the first monument to be added to this already important prehistoric landmark. In fact, recent excavations have shown that during the Roman period, not one but two temples were built on the hilltop here, presumably to commemorate in some way the special quality that that long abandoned hill fort created. Oh. Ah. For a moment, I thought that was the, the jaw of a little wild boar piglet. I think it's just a badger, but the, the recent excavations up here actually showed that there was a cult relating to wild boar on this hilltop. There's this extraordinary string of beads, like a, like a necklace across the, the ridge here. These 
circular mounds, low circular mounds. They're obviously burial mounds. One there, one there, little one there, big one here, another one there. They've all got a little hollow in the centre. Now, these things are down in the archaeological record for these parts as, as Bronze Age burial monuments. But to my eye, they look nothing like that. They look much more like Anglo-Saxon burial mounds. There are plenty of those around here. And I begin to wonder if, if what we're looking at is a manifestation of the continued religious importance of this hilltop. I come through that gate and leave that island of pasture behind me, suddenly I'm gazing across a vast sea of modern arable land, which I've got to cross to get to our next port of call, Sisbury. Twentieth century agriculture has really done incalculable damage to the visible traces of our historic environment. It's almost literally wiped the slate clean. So if there was a wild boar cult associated with that Roman temple on the summit over there, there's precious little evidence anywhere here now for where, as any Asterix lover knows, those wild boar would have wanted to frolic in the oak woods. And if the people inside the hill fort were farming, what trace of their fields now? So the big question is, how do we get back to that lost landscape? How do we find out what this countryside used to look like in the Iron Age, or the Neolithic, or the Bronze Age? Aerial photographs taken before and after the start of 20th century ploughing have allowed English heritage to map traces of archaeological features that have long since been erased. You must be Mr Goring. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hello. Nice to see you. Hi. Yeah. And all this is your land then? Harry Goring is the great-great-grandson of the Charles Goring who planted the tree ring on Chanctonbury. His family have been major landowners here for the past 250 years, and they continue to play a key role in the evolution of the landscape. I mean, before the war, most of this was scrub, gorse, quickthorn, blackthorn, and downland turf, of course. Uh, the war came, people needed food, and a lot of that was, was bulldozed out, and that's certainly what we did, rightly or wrongly, and ploughed a lot of it up. And I think there's no doubt that in places, archaeological remains have been damaged. And now some areas we're putting down more land to grass. Um, on the arable side, we're, we're using a, a less deep cultivator, a minimum cultivator, which is, which is just sort of scrapes the surface. I think um, that's what we saw. Yes, could well one. have been, could well have been, yeah. And how do you resolve that difficult balance between making a living and promoting care of the environment, the historic environment and the natural environment? Well, it's, uh, it's always a difficult one and there's always a clash there. And I think the farmer who has to uh, make a living has got to watch the market. Mm. And if the, if the market in wheat, for instance, gets very high, he's bound to start ploughing. He's going to get out the plough and start ploughing. Through schemes like the, the higher level stewardship scheme, mm. I mean, that's offering incentives to people to, to, to go against the market, if you like. Is yeah. that something you're involved with? It is. We've gone in for that. Uh, we've gone into a, for a 10-year scheme on HLS, uh, partly because, uh, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do, partly because it's financially sensible for us, and partly because we're desperately keen to get back the ground-nesting birds. Ahead of me, the defences of Sisbury Hillfort look incredibly impressive as they sweep around the flanks of the grassy hilltop.
a Changtonbury ring on the horizon behind me. The long and complex history of the reuse and modification of that hilltop seems to have stretched mostly from the Iron Age until the present. But here at Sisbury, things are slightly different. The builders of this fort seem to have inherited a landscape that was already deeply scarred by the activities of their forebears. This stretch of the Iron Age defences runs right over a series of deep pits, the remains of Neolithic flint mines 3,000 years older than the hill fort, so that the modern footpath along the bank undulates up and down. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Kane is the National Trust Warden, whose job involves looking after Sisbury and Chanctonbury. He cares greatly for the archaeological remains, but he's also responsible for the ecology and wildlife. Wow, I hadn't realised until now quite how vast some of these pits are. It, it looks as though you've done some recent clearance work here, have you? Yeah, I mean, we're, this is one of the more recent clearances. We're cutting and coppicing within these pits all the time, maintaining some element of scrub and maintaining the grassland, both from the point of view of exposing the archaeology and also from the wildlife point of view. But, I mean, the pit we're in at the moment it is a large pit, but it's by no means the largest pit on this site. And the whole surface of the ground here is, is just littered with little tiny pieces of, oh, and some quite big pieces as well of, of Neolithic worked flint. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it. Nearby, Worthing Museum has a fantastic display about the Neolithic flint mines, with examples of antler digging tools and the beautiful flint axes that were being manufactured there. The axes were once a gorgeous, glossy black, but after 6,000 years, they've turned almost pure white. Caroline Harriet, like her neighbour Harry Goring, is working hard with funding from a higher level stewardship scheme to look after the archaeological remains on her land better. So you look from above and you have an aerial photo done, you can see where roads used to be, where fields used to be, um, and so we're very aware um, of the fields that we mustn't plough up because we're going to... Caroline is now putting more of her land back down to pasture in order to protect the buried archaeological remains. And she's also using the funding to conserve visible features from the more recent past. Them, like restoring the dew pond, which we've just done this spring, um, we've replanted hedges, we've taken out a shore and put some more trees in. There is so much history and character to the farm that although we've only been there for four years, you know, it is very much part of us um, and we, we love it, yes. Last of all, I'm going to visit Mike Tristram, a local landlord who's going to extraordinary lengths to protect this landscape. I find him pausing for a cup of tea with his sister. Mike, Ruth, so how many generations of your family have been associated with this area? Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, don't know, actually. Let, let me go back and, and <laughs> do, do the recount. Uh, well, it, it, shall we say, we've been involved with this area since at least the early 18th century. Mm. Our family has been rooted here for so many generations that you have the sense of them walking this same ground and that is quite a powerful feeling. Mm. The archaeological remains here must mean something to you as well, just going way back before the 18th century even. Mm -hmm. You have to think about you know, what are we, who are we, and strip away some of today's pressures, uh, think afresh from uh, what life would have been like for people just like us hundreds, thousands of years ago, and that gives you a new way of looking at the world today. Mm. Mike has made it his personal mission to protect Park Brow, an iconic and enigmatic settlement occupied for a thousand years. I was always very uh, drawn to Park Brow. It's a place where, uh, in our grandfather's day, um, they first discovered how this part of the Downs used to be really heavily populated. Uh, in all, all the sort of great Sussex writers of the mid uh, 20th century, imagined what it was like living there. And I've read those things, that meant a lot to me. So it was quite a priority for me to um, protect what was there. All that land now falls within the National Park. How's that going to affect you? The South Downs was created by farm 
businesses, uh, the landscape as we know it. So essentially, it's continuity. Farmers and landowners have got together uh, across the South Downs to work constructively with the National Park Authority and make sure that we all get the best possible national park for all concerned. <laughs>